Herzlich Willkommen zum Sofu Journey Podcast. Mein Name ist Kira Siefert, ich bin Gründerin von Sofu Journey, Autorin und Coach. Heute habe ich zum zweiten Mal eine wundervolle Frau aus den USA bei mir zu Gast, und zwar die Autorin von dem Buch Die Frau, die im Mondlicht aß, Anita Johnston. Vielleicht kennst du sie schon. Im heutigen Interview spreche Anita und ich über die Kraft des weiblichen Zyklus und was dieser mit dem Mondzyklus zu tun hat. Das Interview war für mich selbst nochmal super kraftvoll, wenn es darum geht, die eigene Weiblichkeit anzunehmen und auch den eigenen Zyklus zu ehren und zu feiern. Ich wünsche dir ganz viel Freude und Selbsterkenntnis mit dieser Podcast-Folge. Welcome to the Soul Food Journey podcast show, lovely Anita. It's nice to see you again in the podcast and it's so cool to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. I'm always happy to be here. Oh, yeah. We talked a little bit before and um, we thought about what we want to talk about today. And uh, I told you I had in mind to talk about the feminine cycle What is it about or where is the connection between having an eating disorder and the feminine psyche and the feminine cycle, which every woman knows or should know about? <laughs> Can you directly dive into the topic and maybe share to start with the topic, what, what is the feminine cycle when you talk about it? What do you mean with feminine cycle? Okay, so the feminine cycle is um, the experience that someone in a woman's body has of going through the menstrual cycle, the embodiment of the feminine principle, which exists in all people, men, women, uh, regardless of whatever gender you identify with. So the feminine principle. The, the primary components of it, instincts, emotions, with the, with the feminine cycle, that's the embodiment, that's your instinctual self. And the ancient Greeks talked about the three blood mysteries. Mm -hmm. And the three blood mysteries, or they were considered mysteries because they were times in which blood was shed with no wounding. So you can imagine... It was treated with great awe and reverence. And there were um, rituals, very elaborate rituals. The Illusion Mysteries were, were conducted around this that have been made reference to, but the details of which have been kept secret to this day. But, mm. but what the three blood mysteries were, were um, Menarch, which is the experience of the first period, and birth and menopause because those are connected to women and bleeding with no wounding so mm -hmm. so nowadays we've lost we've lost so much uh, in terms of the understanding and the and the reverence around the cycle which i happen to believe has contributed in large part to the body image distress of girls, and as a result, the prevalence of eating disorders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, do you use, um, or do you have a metaphor for explaining why, why it's, or to explain the importance of the feminine cycle with the different phase, phases or the different parts a woman has to go through when she lives her cycle well well i think there are there are the phases and and they actually connect with the phases of the moon which i really love right yeah. that that you know to be in a woman's body is like the moon in the sense that it's ever changing it's cyclical um, and yet we don't appreciate that so one of the problems is because we don't appreciate the cyclical nature of the feminine, we're trying to be like the sun, 
which is ever constant, always the same, right? So we think we're supposed to have the, uh, you know, when we're in our 60s, we're supposed to have the body we had when we were in our 20s. It, it kind of scrambles the psyche. It, it scrambles our understanding of what it means to be in the body of a female. But it's, but it's even more than that because the feminine cycle was once treated as sacred. Mm. And that's not the case any longer. And they say there are two kinds of secrets, those that are sacred and those that are shameful. And in, mm. and in the absence of the sacred, it becomes shameful. So many modern uh, girls, when they first get their menstrual cycle, they feel shame because the culture has, has brought that in because the sacredness is gone. So rather than being in awe of this give birth to another human being it's really pretty remarkable but that's not the way it's treated typically it's treated like oh my gosh now you have the curse or oh you know uh, uh, be careful don't wear white um, there's this, there's a, there's a tinge of shame around it. Now that's changing. Um, mm. less so are girls being told about, oh, now you have the curse, but it's still happening. And at best it's treated like a non-event. There's no, um, celebration or ritual to honor the sacredness of this very profound transition where a girl is transitioning um, from being from girlhood to womanhood. Mm-hmm. Now, this connects with eating difficulties because if your first experience of coming into the body of a woman is experienced as shameful, then you're not going to want any of those attributes, um, whether it's bigger breasts or fuller thighs or rounder hips, um, there will be shame connected to that. Mm -hmm. And in an attempt to cope with the shame, um, they may try to reduce their body size. Mm, Yeah. When you were talking, I had to think of um, some women I'm also working with, and um, many women with eating disorders, I think, experience that the that the cycle stops at some point that the the menstruation stops and do you think there is from a holistic point of view do you think there is also a meaning of the body just stops your feminine cycle your blood cycle i think so because it's a it's a full blown rejection yeah. i don't want this um, and for many women, uh, being, being in the body of a woman is dangerous. Mm-hmm. They don't know how to handle unwanted sexual advances. Um, they, especially if there's been any kind of history of abuse, but even if there hasn't, I don't think there is a, a woman around that doesn't know what it's like to be the object of um, ridicule or harassment or something that has to do with having the body of a woman. And so um, I think, yeah, when someone starts restricting to the point where the body shuts down the menstrual cycle, or if they're binging and purging and throwing their hormones totally off balance, I think the body responds to that level of rejection. And mm-hmm. in a in a pretty profound way, it says, "Okay, <laughs> not mm-hmm. happening." Yeah, and uh, when when we go back, it's so interesting. <laughs> um, I could ask th- a thousand questions, <laughs> but uh, when we go back in history, where do you think it comes from? This um, yeah, this this two parts of sacred or shame. 
with our bodies or especially with um, the transition from girl to a woman, where does it come from? The shame, why it's no longer sacred? Yeah, yeah. Where does it come from to these two meanings? You can go back 30,000 years. Oh, okay. wow. Um, we're talking, or some people might say as, as far back as maybe mm, 12. But if you look at the ancient figurines, uh, Venus of Willendorf, for example, um, here you have very voluptuous, uh, accentuated female features with big bellies and breasts uh, that, that you know, really demonstrated the power of the female body to create and sustain birth, another human being. Mm -hmm. So I don't know for sure, but the way I um, conceptualize this <clears throat> is with the advent of the patriarchy. And what the patriarchy is, is a patriarchy isn't men. Patriarchy is an imbalance between the masculine and the feminine that gives power to men and takes it away from women. So I think when, when you can go back and think about the awe, how awesome it must have been that women could bleed without being wounded, um, that must have blown people's minds, right? There was an immense yeah. and and give birth to another human being. So the, the patriarchy is, is a, a power principle, and it's all about uh, consuming power. And so I think what happened with the patriarchy is they did not want women to feel the sacredness of this because um, it was the greatest power there is on the planet, right? The power to create life. Yeah. So I think that's how it began, is way, way, way back, and, and, has, and has continued for thousands of years. Um, there are still some cultures where, where, where it is treated as sacred. Uh, in the Republic of Palau, which is an island in Micronesia, not far from where I was born and raised, they still have ceremonies for girls when they start their menstrual cycle. Oh. Um, and and there, the Red Tent, which is a novel, but it's a it's a novel about how back around um, the time of Christianity there were red tents that the women went to when they were bleeding, and many 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 cultures around the world, when they understood the sacredness of it, there were menstrual huts that the women would go to, to, because one of the things that would happen is they would have dreams. And, and this happens to this day. Women who are premenstrual or menstruating, that's often when they have the most profound dreams, the most powerful dreams. And back in ancient times, they understood that these dreams held information that was valuable for the culture. Because when a woman is premenstrual, it is the time that she has the greatest access to the whole of her feminine principle, which includes her intuition. So, mm -hmm. so it's a different kind of knowing. And that was really valued and, and respected um, in, in some ancient cultures. Now, what happened with the patriarchy, it came in and it, and it turned it around and said, no, women have to go into these huts because they're unclean, um, not because they're going to have visions that are valuable for the tribe. Um, uh, and, and then there were certain taboos that were created for women who were menstruating. They couldn't <clears throat> touch certain foods or, or men couldn't touch them. And, and this is a reflection of an awareness of how great the power was, but then it got distorted so that um, it was viewed as shameful, unclean, and destructive. Mm. And we see the carryovers of that in, in our modern Western culture today. It's, um, it's ridiculed. It's, uh, there's certain phrases. Um, um, it's treated in a very dismissive way, um, uh, as though it's, it's like, ah, she's, 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 you know, she's got a period. Or, um, uh, and, and when I was growing up, <laughs> I'm old, I've been around a while, we had, we had different phrases like, oh, she's on the rag. And what that meant was that um, it was a reference to the menstrual pad. And it meant that, you know, she was in a bad mood. 
And, and it was a way of dismissing and still is a way of dismissing women's feelings. So let's say a woman is particularly um, upset about something. Someone might say, oh, oh, you must be having a period, right? Uh, in, a, in a very derogatory way. Now, imagine, and this is, this is what I work with, with, with women. Imagine if you reclaimed that as, as your superpower, right? It's like, yeah. And instead you went, yep, I'm on my period. And guess what? What that means is at this time, um, things that normally I would, you know, just kind of blow off or dismiss, I become aware that they're very important to me. And so I act as though they're very important. Hmm. How, how can anyone shame you for that, right? If you claim it. Yeah, that's a great view. Yeah. What, what, can, what can people do with eating disorders? I, I, I know that there is no uh, solution for everybody, but um, what do you think, what can people do where the period stopped for, for maybe more than half a year? Is there something they can do mentally or also emotionally for themselves to bring themselves more back in a state of feminine flow? Well, I, I think the first thing is to start to shift this and understand uh, the awesomeness of the, the, the feminine cycle. It's not simply just a nuisance or messy. Um, it, it, it carries profound meaning and can help you access a greater kind of knowing, which is your intuition. So if you, let's say, if you um, have an eating disorder and you've lost your period for a while, one of the ways to connect to the natural rhythm that is in your body is through the moon. Mm -hmm. So this is the case, for example, women who have had hysterectomies, right? Um, I, and I remember reading years ago, um, This, this woman named Brooke Medicine Evil. And she was writing about, you know, uh, because there's, there's power in the menses and there's also um, power in the experience of menopause. Mm -hmm. so, so that because they say in the ancient traditions, when you're menopausal, you hold your wisdom within you. And you, it, you don't need the physical marker to say, okay, here, now's the time, tune in. Um, you, it, it's there ever present. And so um, someone had asked her, well, what about if I've had hysterectomy? And, I, you know, I'm, and basically what she said is in the ancient times, there were the council of the white-haired women, and this was the highest council of all. And they were the ones that would decide make decisions that were created uh, that would affect people seven generations in advance. And it was also the women's council that would solve issues. The chief's council could not. And often they were the ones that appointed the chiefs to the chief's council. So what she said is when a woman enters menopause, she said the world right now is in such need of the council of white haired women. There are those that are um, uh, signing up prematurely. So there's a similar thing that happens to someone the, when their body has shut down and it shuts down the menstrual cycle because the body says, okay, we don't have enough nourishment for one person, let alone two. So this is the first system we're going to shut down. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so if, if that is the position you're in, it's important to understand that, yes, with proper nourishment, If you are of age, you can get your cycle back, but you, you want to have it come back with an understanding of the value of that. And so um, one of the ways to connect, though, to your cyclical nature is connect to the moon, the cycles of the moon, so that, again, in ancient times, before there was artificial light, women all bled at the same time interestingly enough, right? Yeah. And, and um, they bled on the new moon. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and I know this uh, because I grew up in, on a small island and um, my aunts and the old women that I grew up around, they lived at a time 
there were there wasn't much artificial light on the island, and they would tell me that that all the women would bleed together. Again, you can see how freaking powerful that must have been, and mm-hmm. and that's why people were in awe. And one of the things the patriarchy has done is it has separated women from understanding that connection. However. Um, many people have noticed that that if you if you hang out with certain girlfriends all the time, you start your cycles start to align, right? Mm-hmm. Um, in households where there are a lot of girls, pretty much everyone has a period at the same time. Um, <clears throat> in convents where women are just living together, they bleed at the same time. So we we still see some of this, but I think if you've lost your period because there's really not enough nutrients in your body to sustain it to while you're working on recovering that to really um, tune into the moon and, and, and find your cyclical nature there. Mm, Yeah. I can imagine that um, some people who are listening to the podcast are now ask themselves, okay, How can I do that? (laughs) Do I just have to look up the moon phases and uh, connect them or write them down and uh, find some of connections to my cycle or to my feelings? Or how can I start to bring the moon cycle and my own feminine cycle or inner cycle together? Well, I think just by, I mean, it can be as simple as paying attention, right? Um, because we don't pay attention. We will say, we will every day, we'll talk about, oh, it's a sunny day today. Oh, it's a cloudy day. We pay attention to the sun. But how many people could say where the moon is this evening, mm. right? So mm. I, I, I'm saying that because I think, even though it sounds simple, just pay attention to the moon phases. Um Putting your attention and intention there is really a big deal in our culture because this gives you an idea of how disregarded and how dismissed and even how devalued this whole thing has been. So yes, you can do it as simple as that or, excuse me, you can create some kind of ritual for yourself. Um, Now, a ritual is when you take something and you create a sacred space for it. So remember, we talked about in the absence of the sacred, it becomes shameful. So you can do a ritual mm, as simple as lighting a candle um, in honor of a particular moon phase. Or you can do something a little more elaborate if you want to create sacred space and maybe um, attune to the four directions or the four times of day or the four primary phases of the moon or um, the four seasons of the year. Because when, you, when you're cre- making something sacred with ritual, you, you call the four, whatever it is for you, <clears throat> in order to create the sacred fifth, which is the center. Um, you can call the sacred fifth here. <laughs> you can call the sacred fifth now. So... By, by using some sort of ritual um, to make something sacred, you're bringing yourself right there, smack dab into the center of your being, into the present moment, into where you are at right here, right now. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that's, yeah. that's the thing about um, creating some kind of ritual is there's no hard and fast rules. Um, but but it does help to call four of something, and it can be the four the four elements: earth, air, wind, uh, wind, and fire. I mean, it's but whatever it is, it's four that creates the center, which is you, mm. and the center of your being. Now, if you think of a woman's body, where is the center? It's about an inch below the belly button, right mm. about where your uterus would be residing, right? Mm, yeah so, so um that's our center yeah yeah and i so my intuition in the first uh, moment said yeah in the in the down part of your belly <laughs> exactly and interesting that it's connected right next door to the belly mm. and, and so um 
and pe- this is where people who have eating disorders they struggle and 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 um, most women who struggle with body image if you ask them well what are the parts of your body you don't like usually they will say something like this belly butt thighs breast now look at that if you were to imagine a woman's body and you were to draw a circle Mm -hmm. that encompassed those parts you're talking about again the most profound superpower of a woman's body the where you can um carry and create and sustain life itself and we yeah. are taught by the culture to hate that to despise it to reject it and you have to understand we're taught this you, a baby isn't born like that right you look at a little baby girl she's she's having a good old time with her body <laughs> she's not you know um looking at her rolls and going oh my gosh what's you know no we're taught that and it's we've been manipulated into seeing our bodies in this way in order to disempower that's really what it's about and so um um to to Reject that is where your freedom lies. Mm. Reject, reject the disempowerment of that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's really, um, yeah, it's kind of mind blowing, mm -hmm. especially in the last part you were talking about. And now it makes so much sense that uh, many people with eating disorders develop the behavior, the, yeah, the eating disorder at the age of 12, 13, 14. That's right. At Because, puberty. Yeah. Yeah. That's the time. We're not told. There's so much we're not told. Even, even, um, even though science knows this. So for example, girls are not told that in order for them to have the hormone progesterone, enough progesterone to start their menstrual cycle, they need an increase of body fat. And so when a girl goes into puberty, she's typically going to put on a lot of weight very quickly. It's supposed to happen so she can have enough body fat to jumpstart um, the progesterone to start her menstrual cycle. So what happens is no, instead in our culture, she's been given images of what a woman's body is supposed to look like <clears throat> and that is um um small breasts flat <clears throat> excuse me flat belly and a thigh gap um yeah. and buns of steel right it's like that's the yeah. image and so when her body starts to morph um the panic it can be tremendous because um she's not been informed and likewise you see it's on both spectrums now the research is showing us that the two high-risk periods in a woman's life for the development of an eating disorder is menarche and perimenopause. So wow. now what we understand is that this is not just a young girl phenomenon. It happens on the other end of the menstrual cycle, the two places where a woman's body starts to morph. So what happens when a woman is perimenopausal, she too starts to put on extra fat, um, typically around her waist, because, and, and she's not told this, but the reason for that is that that fat creates the estrogen that her ovaries have stopped producing as she enters menopause. And, and it has been designed so that um, it, as a protection, it's really her lifesaver um, and, and you, you really can't get rid of it other than through liposuction. But if you did something like that, you would be setting yourself up for many of the symptoms of menopause, the hot flashes and, and all of that. So again, we're not informed. We're not told that these are necessary, valuable changes 
So we treat them as though it's a horrible thing and, and they terrify us because we don't understand them. We don't appreciate the value and the extraordinary wisdom of the body that knows exactly what it's doing and why. Mm, yeah. Do you think um, our society today will go back to the wisdom we already had and can have? Or what do you think, where, where do we go <laughs> as well, a worldwide society? We get to choose. And it, the choice is in the hands of women. You see, because if we claim this and we refuse, refuse to be shamed for having um, a, a female body, um, and it's, start, it's happening now. You see, the, the Me Too movement that's spreading across the world yeah. um, is basically women saying, you know what? I am no longer going to be shamed when somebody did something that was shameful to me. They are the ones that ought to be ashamed of what they did, not me. And I am no longer going to keep this a secret because by keeping it secret, I'm, I'm acting as though it's shameful for me. So uh, it's already starting to happen, you see. Mm -hmm. um, uh, women reclaiming um, their superpower. And um, so um, it, it, it depends on each and every one of us. Because if you claim this and you refuse to be shamed by your, your uh, female body, that's how it all happens. That's how the revolu revolution occurs. Um, and, and, and that shift back. And, and again, it's not, it's not going back to, you know, medieval time, well, even further back than that, in ancient times. It's more than that because um, we would be moving in that direction with a conscious awareness of what happens when you get too far away from it. Yeah. And I happen to believe that girls and women with eating disorders – And I believe this with every fiber of my being because I believe that girls and women with eating disorders that choose the recovery path are the people the world has been waiting for. Because the, as they claim the feminine principle and reclaim it, this is not just for women, but for men as well. Men are terribly out of balance and, and they need the feminine principle. And if we, who are the embodiment of it, um, refuse to be shamed for it, um, then change can happen. Mm. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> great, great words. And I think um, everybody who listened or who is listening to the podcast um, has to think about your words now, <laughs> maybe for a little or longer while. But um, I think it's great to reflect, to reflect yourself. Yeah, to reflect and then have discussion about it, just like what you and I are doing. Um, um, in fact, I, I was just checking on the Light of the Moon Cafe. We have a forum where women communicate. And as someone had just written in yesterday, Uh, that they were astounded because they had never realized that their menstrual cycle was their superpower and that they had been ridiculed and shamed for it and that their body, that the, the, their body was their superpower for them, not, not as an object to be um, looked at or dismissed or used or as an ornament for others but that within their body resided their superpower. And this is someone struggling with an eating disorder and she's getting it. So I think women having these kinds of discussions amongst themselves, which is what used to happen in ancient times. That's what would happen when the women would go to the menstrual huts. They would learn the ways of women from, from yeah. the older ones to the younger ones. And there was, there was a kind of mentoring that was going on. Mm. Yeah, I think there is so much we can we can learn from each other, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, because we have everything <laughs> inside, and uh, when we share it with each other, I think everyone 
get inspired or get to know themselves better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Conversation is so, so important. <laughs> you see, there are secrets that are sacred. Mm. Um, and if they are not treated as such, they become shameful. So when women speak of this and speak of the sacredness of it, it grows. It grows in power. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Ah, Anita, <laughs> thank you so much for all your knowledge um, for the, yeah, I would say wisdom <laughs> you shared with us. Um, because yeah you you are some years older you have more experience um with life uh, with everything which is part of life and um, also with your work working with people with eating disorders i think there is nothing i value nothing more than this <laughs> so thank you so much i really enjoyed talking to you again and i think um everyone will get so much out of it to just go on their own recovery. Well, you're welcome. And if any of your listeners want more of this, <laughs> they can go to lightofthemooncafe.com. Uh, this is a topic that we uh, explore. I'll send out um, sometimes video blogs about this. And so if, if anyone's interested, they can get on the mailing list to learn more. Yeah, and I put everything we were talking about in the show notes and with a direct link so no one has to search for it. They can just just uh, swap on the other side. <laughs> Thank you so much. You are so welcome. Vielen Dank, dass du eingeschalten hast. Ich bin gespannt, welche Gedanken und welche Erkenntnisse du für dich und deinen eigenen Heilungsweg mitgenommen hast. Teile diese gerne bei Instagram unter den Posts mit mir und mit der ganzen SoFood Journey Community. Wir hören uns nächste Woche wieder. Bis dahin sende ich dir ganz, ganz viel Liebe und Energie und natürlich auch ein Hoch auf uns, deine Kira.